So standing behind me, <laughs> our next speaker, uh, William, or Bill Larson, is well known to most of you. A legendary mineral and gemstone dealer for decades, he's an expert on gemstones of San Diego area. So for those of you who went on the mine tour, this talk will be a real treat. Bill will present on the San Diego gemstones and gem localities. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Robert. Aren't we blessed to be in San Diego County? I mean, right now, the weather, Carlsbad, I live 15 miles from here in Fallbrook. It's pretty amazing. I love this uh, conference. Uh, by the way, I love David Attenborough. Uh, beautiful quote and really accurate. So why are, we, why are we fascinated with gemstones? You know, when Ubzug, the old caveman in Europe, picked up a quartz crystal and held it up to the sun, he changed his life. He probably became head of his village. It's, I mean, there's actually documentation of people finding these crystals and they couldn't understand them. It's outside of our, you know, they have symmetry and beauty. And remember, that's what we're here for, gemstones. Beauty, durability, rarity, all the things that build up GIA over the, you know, the 100 years. Uh, of course, I'm sick. I love minerals, crystals. I went to Carl School of Mines and, you know, it was just, there's never enough. And we're lucky here in San Diego County, uh, we have a, we're talking about 10,000 years or more when you talk about India or China or Egypt. I mean, thousands of years of appreciation. And then you go into the Middle Ages here in Europe, and we had birthstones created. We had, you know, centuries. And <laughs> I think one of the funniest things is in the 16th and 17th century, your most trusted person was your physician and your jeweler. I don't think that happens anymore, but uh, maybe for physicians, but jewelers need to be trusted. But in those days, you had healing properties and you had magic. And, you know, we hope that by conferences like this, we'll bring some romance back in and lore. And that's what I'm going to talk about. We have only 125 years here in San Diego, but there's probably more than 150 successful mines and pro prospects that started 125 years ago. The first tourmalines that were found here were actually not in San Diego County. Let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, they were north in Riverside County. This is a photograph by Gordon who did the work with uh, George F. Kuntz. Gordon was his photographer and this fig tree john actually existed in the Himalaya mine in Mesa Grande. And the first people who ever discovered gems here were not Europeans, they were American Indians. There was a, a private museum called the Berg, Bergman Museum that was on the way to Palm Springs. He had two arrowheads that had been dug up in Indian graves. And the famous story, which led to George F. Kuhn sending Tannenbaum out here and then later himself from Tiffany's was that the, there was a cowboy in Mesa Grande at the store. And he saw Indians playing in the dust with nodules of tourmaline, which are extraordinarily rounded, beautiful, flawless tourmalines. They had come from the Himalaya mine. There wasn't called that then. And he took them down to San Diego. They did the proper GIA uh, authenticating test as he scratched glass with them. Uh, and <laughs> realized they were gemstones. He sent them to New York. Some of them wound up with George F. Kuntz, who started to work uh, at Tiffany's as a tourmaline specialist because he brought Maine tourmaline to uh, comfort Tiffany. Uh, fabulous country, uh, company. And he didn't come out personally then. He hired a guy named Tannenbaugh who set up the Himalaya uh, Mining Corporation in New York. People wonder how the Himalaya mine got its name. Well, it was a New York corporation. They also owned turquoise mines and things. So, you know, you have this rich history coming up. And the first mine in San Diego County was the, was the Stewart Mine. It was uh, found in, a, in the late 18, or early 1890s, and uh, it was mined as a, a mercury mine. They thought it was cinnabar. Well, those of you who've been up to the Stewart Mine, they, they mine tens of thousands of, well, tons. They mine thousands of tons of lipidolite, which is a purple mica. And there's pieces that weigh five, 6,000 pounds. They were sure they had cinnabar. They started mining the lipidolite, uh, and they found tourmaline. So that's, it was an exciting thing, and then people from all walks of life started to come to San Diego and hike the hills. I mean, these, are, these are some characters here. Uh, Frank Salmon's at the at extreme right, he became named as the Salmon City where all the miners lived. This is the Palachief Mine 
Um, it's probably 1902. It's before they hit the treasure pocket, which you'll see later. And look at these guys. That's what they were mining in. Oh, no. Maybe they were waiting for their photo. <laughs> That's a hardy group and tough. So, you know, it's, it's fabulous, fabulous history here. And then the, the, the one that produced perhaps the most was the Himalaya mine. Um, I've been blessed I owned all three of these mines at one time. Uh, I don't own them anymore. I've sold various ones. But this is a pocket. I can probably show you here. Is this the famous thing? Yeah. That's a pocket. They were pulling out tourmalines by the ton. Uh, you can't imagine how rich it was. Actually, the tourmaline king mine might be the record. One pocket produced nine tons of utmost finest rubellite. I mean, just amazing. So here's your area mines. There, again, like I said, there's probably 150 that are logical. They go all the way down to the border with Mexico, but not very successful ones. We're going to concentrate on three mining areas, Pala, uh, Ramona, and Mesa Grande because I, I could speak for two hours just on the Himalaya. You need money to mine. And the Empress Dowager, she, she, loved pearls, well, jadeite first, pearls tw second, and pink tourmaline became her third. And she arguably, uh, according to various records, uh, Dick Johns and whatnot, perhaps had 90 tons of tourmaline shipped to her. All the mandarins had tourmaline buttons. They came in, you know, various colors. She didn't like the green. So the famous story in the, in the Depression was that you could go up to Himalaya Mine and find green tourmalines because you used to break them and in half, the pink and green. They would break them in the middle and send them to her. That's, uh, she was a, quite a character. She died in 1908, and of course that was the, the, the money. But in that period, and, uh, and of course going forward, she made snuff bottles and fantastic art objects, pendants. These are mandarin button. And these are all, I mean, these are old. And I, I first saw this pendant. This is from the King Mine. I know the colors. Uh, I could be argued on origin, but probably I'd win on this one. Because that color is unique. You get, uh, it, this is from that nine ton pocket probably where you, they write it up on. It filled up a picnic table down in Pala proper. And uh, that weighs 300 carats. I first saw it when I gave a lecture with George Rossman at, at uh, Bowers Museum. And then a nice lady, years later, 25 years later, she came and said, I'm selling this back to China unless you want to keep it in America. And I finally was able to, to keep that here. So that'll probably be on display at GIA one of these years. 1906, they were already famous. This is from the Pala Chief Mine, uh, internal publication. I mean, they really, they, they did publicity. Uh, they even gave a two kilo piece to the Pope which I presume is still in the Vatican. I think Raquel was over there recently, so maybe uh, she saw it. Uh, Peter Eat, a very famous mineral dealer in New York, already advertising. This is a 1905 or 6 ad. So this is Himalaya Mine in Mesa Grande. So 1900, up until about 1912, this area was phenomenal. The first noted uh, pink barrels were actually from Utah, not here. And they were not the Wawa, they were the Thomas Range, but in, uh, it never got named. And by 1910, George F. Kunz, of course, found pink barrel. This is from the Esmeralda. He found lots of pink barrel in Pala and Mesa Grande, and he had the clout to get it named for J.P. Morgan. So it became Morganite. It was a big fight between the Germans trying to get it, uh, their name from Madagascar, and they were probably first, but he had, J I mean, J.P. Morgan was J.P. Morgan. So, and then one of the exciting things was George F. Kunz, of course, found uh, these. He got them sent to him again at Tiffany's. You're the vice president at Tiffany's. You do get some advantages. And uh, this is Baskerville. He literally got nine of these. And uh, from these kind of crummy little samples, they figured out it was purple uh, uh, spodumene. So George F. Kunz wrote this book. He, by the way, had a library that went to the USGS that's extraordinarily good. It's not as good as GIA's, but it's really something. He, had, uh, he, he did write more than 20 books and probably 100 pamphlets. I mean, he's, he's prolific. And the people that I knew in New York who'd heard from people who'd been at Tiffany's, you know, it's like third generation, said he was really a good guy. I mean, his 190 book, uh, 1908 book on the pearl is still, like, amazing. It's, it's, it's pertinent today. So this is, of course, on California, 1905. It's an extra Excellent, excellent reference. It should be reproduced because it's still pertinent. Uh, what's funny is the first editions came out and Aubrey was 
uh, the head of, of California Mine Bureau, and he took uh, credit for uh, uh, being the author, and George F. Kuhn's put it out second and third editions with this cover. <laughs> the first one was green, and he put it in his Kuhnsite colors, and he made sure Aubrey's name was secondary. <laughs> Pretty good. Interesting. Now, there's an original picture of George F. Kuhn's with one of the most famous Kuhnsites, uh, because the reason it's famous is Tiffany and Company and the gouache. That's the original. Dick Johns got it. It was a gift from Tiffany's to Richard Johns uh, when he was at Stanford and writing all these fantastic papers on Pala and uh, Ramona and whatnot. So that's the original gouache. But Tiffany and Company is right down there embossed. And I was lucky enough he sent it to me. Well, well, he knew I owned this. I got the Kuhnsite from Dr. Peter Bancroft through Dave Wilbur. So that is Kuhn's original Kuhnsite. You know, he sits there and holds it. So I'm kind of blessed on that. So it's really, really an amazing. The only thing that happened with Kuhnsite is they were selling it like crazy out of Tiffany's. And of course, the ladies would go over to the, the beaches. Uh, I guess there's sunshine in New Jersey. I can't remember. No. <laughs> and it fades. So when it comes out of the Pala Chief Mine, which is where these were from and others, uh, it was superb color, dark purple, but it is uh, light sensitive, so you, you, the, the, it did lo lose some value. But he, he went on. I mean, there's George F. Coons. What a character. Um, he, he lived from, I think, 1862 to 1930-something. and I mean, he was just prolific in going places. He was doing what, you're, what Vim is doing, going to the location, getting the best he could. Uh, and he was amazing at what he was able. And here you go, look at here. This is 1912, very ending of the gem thing. Oh, who's that written by? Oh, that's right, Tiffany and Company. And it's to uh, Frank Sammons, who I mentioned as the character. So, you know, these are, uh, Tiffany's was really involved in San Diego County at promoting the stones and, and getting the material. And uh, thank God they were, so it, it kept going. This is from the treasure pocket. Uh, that's probably an original base. Uh, I found this uh, through a friend in Montana, and they'd bought it in 1904 from the Pala Chief mine. And you see that color is just amazing. And if that isn't good enough, those are Raquel Alonso Perez's hands with the, uh, she got it back from the cleaners that day, and I happened to be there in Springfield show, and she, we put it in the sun, and that's the color. I mean, it's just extraordinary Pala tourmaline. A beautiful little rabbit carved in Kofu more recently, but look at that color again. So in 1950s, a renaissance came. We had the Depression, we had a war, we had, you know, America went through various things. So in the 50s, a guy named Dawson got the White Queen mine and he went in and hit a pocket. Those quartz crystals are 500 over pounds each and they're transparent inside with lithiophyllite and various extraordinary inclusions and he cut them in half and made art objects. Well, when he was going after the quartzes, he uh, found morganites, big morganites, and just beautiful specimens. So you know, this started a, a kind of a, a re renaissance and you had Ralph Potter took the Himalaya mine over in 1958, hit pockets till 1963, and then you know, we got involved. My company is Pal International. I worked with Ed Sabota, and uh, we got, he bought the Stuart mine, and we got three other mines we were able to purchase. And this is the Stuart mine, and those of you who know Peter Bancroft, that's a young Peter Bancroft. He was about 50 then. He lived to be 99. He worked for me for seven years. What a, a jewel of a guy. And this is the start of our going back into the Stuart mine. It looked really good. We knew we were after the lost tourmaline at it. And damned if we didn't find it. We went right through, fell into it, and there were still tourmalines on the floor because they didn't have a lot of value when they closed the mine in the 20s. Uh, you know, it's a thick pegmatite. You have the hanging wall, the foot wall, and we had to use blasting equipment, and we got a little more advanced using very old front end loaders. And uh, there's Skip Zenix, who's still the curator of one of the great private collections in the United States. He found this pocket. He deserves all the credit in the world. He's the one who found the lost tourmaline at it. And those are fantastic rubellites for, for the steward. They're four inches, five inches long. There's, a, and you know, we have gem mines, you meet neat people. As John Sinkankis, your library at GIA. He had kind of took over my life a little bit. My dad and he were great friends. And when I was 15, he took me to the Benito White mine. So he's a great guy. There he is high grading our mine, but with legal permission. But he liked to keep what he found. So, <laughs> and then there's a gentleman, 
by Edward Gublin. That's 1971 because the AGS conclave was in San Diego at the Hotel Coronado, Del Coronado. He came up. He was so excited. He helped me more than anybody else probably in gemology. So he was just an amazing man. And later I got to hire his grandson, Edward, because I used to send Edward mineral specimens for his birthday. Um, <laughs> how do you get even with Dr. Gublin? Anyway, it was pretty fun. So in 1972, we had an extraordinary pocket in the Queen Mine called the Blue Cap Pocket. And we celebrated, and people from all over the world came. We had 135 people. We had Fulch Girona from Spain. We had Desitels. We had Peter Embry from the British Museum. 130. We had a whole cow barbecue. Josie Scripps did that. Uh, it was amazing. And why were they celebrating here? Well, they came for these, the Blue Caps. That's on display in Houston. My uh, ex-partner, I mean, uh, Ed Sabota, kept that and then sold it to Dave Wilbur and wound up in the Houston collection. And that's phenomenal. It's about this big. I dug it. I got lucky. Um, Ed and I would alternate. And he found as many as I did. But I found this one. And I got to find this one. And then uh, that I dug with my father about two weeks earlier at midnight, going up to the Queen Mine in fog or clouds with the headlights and our old <laughs> dilapidated four-wheel drive showing off. And then we dug this. And what's fun is I dug this part with my dad. And then we went 18 inches in the pocket through hard clay, and we found that one. And it fit. And it was like, oh. So that went to the Smithsonian and is on display. There's the genius who found it, John McLean. Uh, we were overseas when he found that area. And uh, these are later pieces that came out of the Queen. Never produced anything as good as that one pocket area. But they cut fabulous stones. This is a 60 carat. We made that for the AGS conclave when it was in Washington, DC. Uh, Ramona. Spessartite tight used to be really rare. People forget. Uh, when I took my GG, I never did the diamonds, but I did take the colored stones. The correct answer for the GG, GG test was written in the 60s. Uh, Vince Manson helped modernize it. The correct answer was Africa is a relatively minor source of colored stones. That was the correct answer. I wrote, I, I was terrible. My poor proctor, I would write like volumes of what, how bad they were because so, I'd been in Africa quite a bit. So, but Spessar type was really rare at the turn of the century and even recently. But here's the Little Three Mine and the Hercules Mine in Ramona. Uh, the un fortunate part now is the town is encroaching, so I doubt if there'll ever be any more mining there. But fabulous color. And uh, there's uh, the work of Mia Dixon, who Robert has helped enormously to get so much better. Those are seven carat stones. Blue topaz used to be rare. You know, before they learned to irradiate, it was phenomenally rare. That's a huge piece. It's this big. Josie Scripps had that. And then we cut these, and they used to be, you know, kind of exciting. Uh, and then here's the one that was really amazing. The Himalaya mine, I took it over uh, when, we, when we split up. And uh, I put in a lot of energy here. You see the old guys, they were pretty scary good. Again, they're in their Sunday best. I mean, look at that, <laughs> the ties and things. <laughs> there are so many stories about these guys. Uh, I, I have to read you one quote out of uh, George F. Coons. I'm running out of time. So. This is directly about Tiffany's. Uh, direct quote, during 1904, about six tons of rough tourmaline was shipped to New York. Of this, 300 to 400 pounds were fine nodules and pencils of the highest grade. So even in 1904, they were hitting a fortune in this, this place. And uh, I mean, that's pretty exciting. So we got involved. I mean, I, I started, uh, I hit quite a lot of terminaling there. We brought over Eder Oberstein. That's Gerhard Becker, for those of you who heard of him. And in there, he got inspired to make the hummingbirds, which you've seen. The GIA owns some, and I own quite a few. But they're just fun. We know, oh, there's troglodytes, you know. You get, that's my son, Will, and my son, Carl. Uh, we have a GG there, and he's more of a mineral guy. So if you see him at Tucson, you can tell him you saw him when they were high grading the Himalaya mine. <laughs> There's a typical pocket with clay, and you can see the tourmaline right there. Pretty fabulous. And uh, beautiful color. We had inclusions, but the color was fantastic. But whatever was making the color of the radiation really did you know, cause some inclusions. However, the bicolors were flawless. That was a good day. So I don't know, today that would be worth half a million dollars. But then we sold it. That's probably 40, 50 grand down there. It was, you know, it was a never ending story. You have to sell to keep mining. We didn't have an Empress Dowager. We did find this, though, and I kept that. That's 75 carats clean. 
to the recent is the Ocean View. A great guy, Jess Wanger. That's me and John, and we went in there, and you know, there's my son, a few years older, Will. That's a big kunzite. And if you don't like that, how about this? And if you don't like that, that's 2.2 kilos. That's the big kahuna he told you about. Uh, with a 225 carat stone, I was lucky enough I do own it. So it'll be preserved here in San Diego. So it's got some, look at the bicolors he produced. What colors? Blues. Now this is the mine we're doing now, the Mountain Lily. Um, I can't say we've made a small fortune because we haven't. But we did hit this about five weeks ago. Uh, Emeralite tourmaline, they called it. And then there's a friend of mine, Eric Long, from Dallas, mining like crazy, or actually Austin. But here's the pocket. There's a blue topaz, there's a quartz crystal, and a uh, watermelon. And uh, there's my son, Carl, a bit older than the other picture, and that's what it looked like. And it looks like Afghanistan colors. It's the wear tunnel in the Mountain Lily Mine. And I think, officially, I've got five seconds left. Thank you very much.